Yeah. All right, we're live. Hey, thanks for watching. We're here at the Armstrong booth. What booth are we at? Uh, Tony? 7762. 7762. So if you're in the show and seeing this, come on by and see it. What we got here. So Tony Mormino, I'm here with Tony first. And Tony, 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 Tony. Okay. <laughs> Nice to see you. So what are we going to talk about today? So Tony? what we're going to talk about today is the DEPM IBS, which is Wait, say that again. DEPM IBS. Okay. It's a so pump, right? It's a pump. This thing looks like it's from Star Wars. So I'm not uh, really sure. Close. So what it is, it's our newest next generation Good. pump, highest efficiency technology. What we've done is, if you remember the last time we talked, we talked about our DPM small frame motors, the small permanent magnet motors. Right. And this you were going to put that in the bigger. Right. This is the permanent magnet motor, large frame ah. version. So this one's up to 60 horsepower. It's the 50 horsepower is available today. The 60 horsepower will be available in another few months. Uh, but the thing about this is it's significantly lighter in weight. Okay, before we go into that, for the people who don't know or don't understand, even though they've read it 50 times, what a permanent magnet motor is, including me, can you explain it in layman's terms? Certainly. <laughs> so for years and years and years, we've used squirrel cage induction motors. That's a standard motor with the That's copper wire standard motor, and copper windings copper on the rotors, a lot of steel in the motor. The problem with- Is there a magnet in that motor? No, there is no magnet it, in the it motor. It becomes the, a magnet when it- Right, as soon as we it. add electricity to it, we create two rotating magnetic fields. That's what fields, causes the motor to spin. And that's what right. causes the motor okay. to spin. Got that. Well, the problem is that about 30 to 40% of the energy you Good. put into that motor goes into creating the second magnetic field in the rotating element. So you have two components. You have the stator, which is the outer copper winding, and then you have the rotor, which is the part that spins round and round. Gotcha. Okay. Well, part of the energy we put into that motor goes to create that magnetic field in the rotor. Got it. Well, that energy is essentially lost. Okay. Because it's, it's not turned into work. Right. It's really not gotcha. turned into work. Well, what we figured out working with our motor manufacturers is we figured out that if we can take and take that rotor and change it. Yep. And make that rotor out of permanent magnets and get rid of all that iron, all that copper, all the steel, and put rare earth permanent magnets on the outside of it, that rotor field stays magnetized all the time. So these magnets are made or they're actually found in the earth? They're, are they're magnetized. It's a, it's a material that's found in the earth and gotcha. is formed, formed into the magnets. Formed into the magnet. Um, but it's, it's always oxygen. a magnet. Right, it's, it's always a, a magnet. magnet. It doesn't need current. Right, the, the motor's magnetized all the time. Gotcha. So what happens is, we save about 40% of the energy input because we don't have to create that second magnetic field. By not having- How much create, energy? About 40%. So it's a big deal. Significant amount of energy. And then of course, you know, you couple that with variable speed, you couple that with running off, off full speed curves. There's a huge energy savings. With sure, that. yeah. Um, Do we so, still go in horsepower ratings? Yeah, it's still, it's still okay. horsepower ratings. Nothing there changed. So it's we're hanging still, in there with that horsepower. Baby. Right. It's, not, we still got to have that Well, because we have to have a frame of reference. Right. Uh, we still keep the NEMA frame sizes. None of that changed. I got you. Okay. So they're also significantly quieter. Okay. okay. So part of that savings, energy, you know, part of that noise, there's just some acoustic issues with creating those two magnetic fields. The other thing that's happened is, you know, we've had the DEPC, our control card for a long time which tells us all the wonderful things about what the pump is actually doing. Speed, power, flow, head. Right. All of that information shows up on the screen. Okay, so let's stop, let's stop for a second. So for those who are watching who've never seen a DE pump, this has the controls, the speed change, all the sensors, everything's in this panel. Here. Right, so we don't rely on- And it's so, vertical inline. Right, this so is a vertical inline We'll talk inline about pump. that in a minute, but yeah. So when I look at traditional variable speed pump control, I put pressure transmitters out in the system, right? and those pressure transmitters report back to the BAS, and then the BAS tells the pump what to do. Got it. The problem with that scenario is that that pressure transducer can go out of calibration. There is a set point associated with that. We all know that buildings, as permanent as buildings are, they're not permanent. No, they're, always, it, right. in, they're always yeah. getting remodeled. I've done a lot of hospital design over my career and doing hospital design. Hospitals, on average, every five years, they're going through a recycle right, because right. 
their technology changes. Their technology changes faster than ours does. Right. And so because of that, they're constantly changing. Their needs are constantly changing out in the building. And as their needs change, where that BAS pressure transducer is, maybe in the wrong spot. Right, right. And it has to get moved. Right. Well, and it rarely does. So what we want to, what we do is we know there's some really cool things that we know about pumps. When I look at what we know about pumps, we know speed, flow, power, okay? Because right. they all follow the affinity laws. You remember that from way right, back when. Right, right. And so because we know the affinity laws and we know there's a very distinct relationship between speed and flow. Okay. If I cut the speed by 50%, I cut the flow by 50%. Okay. It's a direct we relationship. Know it's a direct relationship. Power, however, moves up and down by the cube, depending okay. on whether we're going increase in speed or decreasing speed. Well, as flow changes, as flow change demand out in the system changes, what happens is that the power requirements for the pump change. So imagine I'm running the system, I'm running full capacity, and I start to close control valves out in the system. Right. Okay. Pressure I'm starting, increases. I'm starting to increase the pressure. The speed is up here, but the power moves down faster than the speed does. Got it. Okay. Because I'm moving less water. The control logic that's in here sees that change in power and goes, oh, hey, I'm not using this much power. I can slow down to get back onto my speed power curve. I get it. Yeah. So that means I don't have to have that sensor out in the system. You're just looking at this. I'm looking at this. And are, are you? do we map that at the factory first yes. based on the drawings, or do we actually plug it in, pipe it up? And so we actually put the pump on a test stand. It's mm -hmm. on a factory, cal it's on a calibrated test stand. Got it. So it's we real high end, end, precise. It's yes. not, and you And know. we plot a number of points on the pump curve. Got it. So we know exactly what that curve looks At this looks power, like. this speed is X GPM. At exactly. this power, this speed is X GPM. So exactly. you plot that and then you know. Got right. It. Okay. And and that's part of the reason I brought my good friend Tunji over here with us. All right. Um, Tunji works on our optimization and digitalization suite. Um, and one of the cool things, because we've digitalized all of this, and because we've got all this embedded logic in here, we've taken this information and we can send it up to our cloud server called Pump Manager. Nice. Now, Pump Manager has some really cool features, and I'm gonna let Tunji talk about those because he's a lot better at talking about that than I am. <laughs> no, that's fine. And he's all, he's almost as dynamic as I am. <laughs> not quite, not quite as dynamic. No, I mean, you hit all the points. So once we're able to get all of this advanced uh, data off of our pumps, that's where the fun starts for me and my team on the data analytics where we can track things like excessive vibration, if it's deadheading, which by the way has nothing to do with the pump, that means that there's some valve downstream that slams shut, pump's still running, that's not good. You don't wanna right. leave your pump in a deadhead scenario for too long. So those are some of the advanced analytics that we can do, which is a little bit harder to do in the mechanical room because it requires a lot of data and data analytics. You need like a cloud server to crunch all of it. And so that's what right. me and my team do here. Only possible with the design envelope technology. Do you alert people when something's happening? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So once you're on Pump Manager and the data is there, customers, owners of that equipment can have alerts coming live to their cell phones or their email addresses if they have a service department. And you can keep an eye on pumps if they're in, say, New York and you're playing golf out in California. Nice. If that would be your predilection to be looking at your pumps while you're right. golfing in California. So, <laughs> so what's really cool with this technology Thank you, yeah, no is not only does it have you know, all this data analytics and you can get it through, you know, you can sit in front of your desk on yep. your desktop PC and you can go to pump, the pump manager website. We also have an app for your phone because who doesn't carry a cell phone anymore? Yeah. Right, right. And now that, that app, that information is available in the palm of your hand. If you're out on the golf course, <laughs> you know, I mean, let's, instead let's of really looking at like Instagram and TikTok, you just sit there and look at pump managers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we're a little bit weird. We, you know, we don't do the TikTok videos. But the, the cool part is, though, you know, for a building owner, right? Okay. So let's say you're the the facilities manager for a hospital. Right, right. Well, I'll put this in real world terms. If you're the facility manager for a hospital, hospitals do surgery 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. Because emergencies happen. Yes. Well, let's say that. Your loved one is in a terrible accident. They're in the hospital. They have to go to surgery. And 
the you're the facility guy, and you're out sitting on the beach. Yeah. Or yeah. you're out playing golf, and something happens to the pump that causes the chilled water system to go down. Right. Right. Well, if you're the loved one on the o on the operating room table, now the temperature is going to get out of control in that room. The risk of infection goes up exponentially. I get it. So it's serious stuff sometimes. It's serious yeah. stuff. And so what happens is now, oh, I got the alert. I know what's going on. Here's right. what I need to do. Right. And by having that information immediately, rather than waiting four hours for the hospital to call you. Right, right. Um, now you have it instantaneously. You can react to it faster. The Love other it. piece to that is we can actually tie that to services. Okay, so we take that information to the next level. Right, right. Once we have that, now we're going to take that same information and we're going to send, we can dispatch a service contractor based on that information. Nice. Or if you're the building owner and you go, I want XYZ service contractor to know when my pump starts to have a right, problem, right. we can send that information to them. They can be there right away to fix the problem. Right, right. You know, with, as Tunji mentioned, nice. the, the vibration information that we track. So we vibration map every one of our pumps right. in the factory. When that pump goes out into the field, we can do some recalibrations to it to pick to take care of nuisance vibration that may be in the mechanical room. Right. Once we've gotten to that point, we have a baseline vibration signature. Well, if I deadhead a pump, if I have a pump seal start to go bad, if I start to cavitate because you know, I got a suction strainer if it's plugged up, something like that. Right, right. All of those things cause changes in that vibration signature. Right. Well, if I fix it early before it becomes a major problem, now instead of it being a couple thousand dollar repair, it may be a two hundred dollar repair. I'm sure. Yeah. Out the strainer. Yeah, right. Um, so those are things that those are the other part. And of there's the a analytics. big movement in that right now to get more data out of the building. Absolutely and prevent these things from happening. Right. Provided someone's trained to look at it all and do all that. Right. So and the other thing is we all talk about sustainability. Mm -hmm. And as you are, as you're well aware, you know, there's a big push to reduce carbon. We're trying to reduce our carbon footprint. Right. And based on some data that I've seen recently, if we don't get our act together and really start to step up our game yeah. in the retrofit market, in the new build market, we're not going to meet our carbon reduction goals. I can tell you that right now. We're yeah. not going to get there. Well, what are we going to do? Well, with some of the analytics that we have in here, we can tell you. So if you got a facility has got a sustainability manager, they can track what their carbon reduction has been by imparting this technology into their pumping system. Versus another technology. Right. Versus any other technology. I mean, you know, versus hanging a drive on the wall. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, drive on the wall, it'll speed up, slow down the pump, but you don't get any of those analytics. That's you right, don't right. get any of that information. It tells you what you're doing to help the environment. I get it. So we what's the cost compared to a standard motor? And are these readily available now? Yes, these are readily motor? available. Um, yes, the permanent magnet motors are a little bit more expensive. Sure. Well, you get a 40% um, but, reduction. But if I look at it on average, I'm going to pay for the incremental difference. Right. Because you understand, you know, we're, we're talking about the incremental difference, not the right. whole thing. Correct. So looking at that incremental difference, we're usually under a two-year payback. No brainer. And it could be less than that. Depends on the pro on the load profile, right, what right. the run hours are, and what the building is and that really delta doing. will come down as these become more popular. Right. Do you as see the, a movement where in 10 years they're all going to be permanent? Yeah, I, we, see that, really? we see that going away. Even standard know. pumps? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of new technology that's coming. Um, pumps are getting smarter and smarter every day. We're getting smarter and smarter motors. Yeah, yeah. It's getting better. Yeah. Um, there's something over here I got to show you guys. We Are we going to look at the model? Yeah, we're going to go Let's look at the model. It. Come on, Heather. <laughs> we're going to go over to the model. So here we're going to talk about vertical inline pumps in general, why you would use one. A lot of that was more for the motors and the DE technology, but now we're gonna talk about actual like benefits of using vertical inline versus standard motors. So. so what this is, hold on a second. Ready? Hey, if you're watching live, thank you. Thanks for watching. All right, so what we've done, a couple things to think about. You know, 
you look around the show floor, there's all kinds of manufacturers here. And some of the equipment that's here is tens of thousands of pounds of steel. It takes an awful lot to ship that steel here. This is really nice. Okay. Yeah. So what this amounts to is I can show you the same technology. I can show you what everything looks like so cool. in one sixth scale, but this weighs 25 pounds. Did you ship like that in one piece or did you guys? Um, no, it actually ships in, in multiple pieces. That's so cool. Okay. But, um, the brainchild's walking around here someplace. <laughs> yeah. Um, you guys made this in house, right? Yes. This is all done in house. Printed. Uh, it's all 3D, call print, that? 3D, 3D printing. 3D printing. 3D printing. So if you look at this, this is your traditional base mount end suction pump. pump that's been around forever. Right. Drive on the wall, base mount end suction pumps, no intelligence in the pump. We got our inline flow meter. So you have to add all this stuff to make it work. Right. Okay. So you see the footprint. I mean, this thing takes up a lot of room. Right. Okay. Well, let's, let's move to a better model. Okay, vertical inline pump. Right. Okay, you notice I got rid of all the steel for the inertia base. Yeah. Okay. I reduced the footprint. I took the drives off the wall. And you notice I don't have a flow meter because the flow meter is built into that same DEP te DEPC technology. Yeah. Notice how much less space yeah. vertical inlines take. And the up. drive is shown over there. No, right. is this the drive? That's the drive. That's supposed to be the drive? Okay, yeah. got it. And so now we've drives. got a unit mounted drive. Right. So we saved the wiring cost. We still have to wire up between the drive and the pump. But now, instead of going from the source, power source, to the drive, the drive to the motor, now... All right, it's single I'm source. If the drive is provided by one guy, installed by another guy, right. the pump's by another guy, the, the control's by another guy. Yeah. The other thing that happens here when I put the drive on the pump, so you've heard about power line, you've heard about harmonics. One of the greatest contributors of harmonics and noise, electrical noise in a building, is the drive. length of the wire between the, the drive, drive to, the, to the motor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now I just shortened that up considerably. I mean, this thing could be 50 feet away from the motor. Right, Here, right. You know, right or this far. Right. Okay. So there's a significant cost savings in going to this. I also don't have to have vibration isolators. This pump is designed to be 100% pipe mounted. So I don't need vibration isolation. There's a whole lot of things that make this a better scenario. What are some common myths you hear repeatedly about vertical inline pumps? They don't last as long. Why would someone say that? Because, so the, I don't mean to beat up on the guys at ASHRAE, but the ASHRAE equipment like database. Yeah. Equipment made it into the database only when it got, on it, when it failed or when it had to be replaced. The very first vertical inline pumps that we I ever see where built, you're going. Yeah. were built in the 1970s. Right. They yeah, are, these have been out there for 100, whatever. I don't they know are still in right. service in New York City, right. have not been changed. Right. They are still the original pumps. Well, guess what? They're not going to get put into the database until they fail. Yeah, yeah. It's all Okay. So, so there's, there's a big, huge reason. Do you hear a pushback on vertical inline as much as you used to? Nah. It really, is, really, really has gone away. Okay, good. Um, so we don't even. Use you know, I, I get some pushback that oh, I still got to have some kind of base underneath it because I got seismic. Well, yeah, okay, I get that. But you got to have a, that with that too. You got to have it with that too. That's a special instance. Yeah. Okay. So now we move into a similar vertical inline, except this. This has the permanent magnet motor technology on it. Okay, this is the smaller one. Okay, and. We've got these two sized. Instead of each one of these being sized for duty standby, these two are sized to operate in parallel. Would this be the equivalent horsepower? The two, equip, two of them together are equal to one of these. Okay, gotcha. And the reason for that is, if I understand a pump curve and I understand the system curve, okay, we understand that head moves up and down by the square, right? Yeah. As, as flow moves up and down, the head moves up and down by the square. So at one pump running by itself in a, in a parallel operation pair, if one pump fails, that single pump will provide about 80% of the design flow at 100% speed. Nice. Okay, because it's going to follow the system curve. I get it. And so 
how much redundancy do you need in the building? Now, yeah, okay, if it's a hospital, it's a data center, yeah, you need the redundancy. Sure, yeah. But in that case, I just put three of them in. So I size each one of them for three of them at 50% each. Yeah. Okay. If I'm doing a school building, how much redundancy do I need in a K-12 school? You don't need much. No. Right. Because when are the kids there? You know, they're they out of school. They want to go home anyway. Right. So, you know, if I if I can provide 80%, right. I'm going to cover their load the vast majority of the time. I get it. So then we really start to move into really cool technology. This is a Tango. So it's a dual head vertical inline pumps. So it's two rotating assemblies on a single piping connection. Right. Keep going. Okay. So if you think about this, in this scenario, I got to have four pipe drops to meet my connections, right? Yeah. If I move over here, each one of these is sized for 50%, but I only have one pipe connection. So I just cut my pipe drops and my piping cost significantly for the install cost. I've of the heard building. the term dual arm pump. Is that yes. what that is? So dual arm and tango. Same Tango's thing. the smaller one. The dual arms are the bigger got ones. It. Okay. Uh, we've got some exciting Two pumps, new tech. one casing. Yes. So you got one connection. Got it. So <clears throat> significant install cost savings. Yeah. And again, 100% pipe mounted. We don't need the vibration isolators. We don't need an inertia base. Right. We have all the same technology with connectivity for pump manager and all that. None of that changes. So you still have all that really cool technology. Very well, nice. Well, then... If we look at this and we go, okay, you know, what can we do from a modular perspective? What can we do from a factory assembled, factory built, factory designed perspective? And this is an IFMS. So it's an intelligent fluid management system. Basically, we build this entire assembly, the frame, the piping, the headers, everything yeah. in our factory. It's, hydro it's hydrostatically tested. Pumps are already there. They've been run tested. Everything's done. The controls are on them. The power connections, everything is there, and it's all factory built. And it shows up to your job site looking exactly like this. Nice. Okay? And if you look at the You can build the size, this in parallel with the, with the building and all that right. stuff, right? Yeah. And if you look at the footprint, as we move from there to here, significant change in footprint. Huge, and we yeah. can do this, and we can do it. We could put two tangos in there. We could put two dual arms in there. We can put two conventional BILs. We got a lot of options of what we can do and how we can build this. Awesome. And all of I this, love it. I love all this of this has this the same connectivity. It's the first time you've debuted this display, right? Yes. And and one of our regional sales managers is actually the guy who came up with the concept yeah. for this. Um, him and another one, they worked together to come up with this along with one of our OEM engineers. Nice. To do all the CAD work and everything to make this all work. I love it. Very so, good. Anything else we need to look at, or did we cover the highlights? I think we covered the highlights. Uh, awesome. You know, Tunji, you got anything else you want to throw no, in I here? I think you hit all the points really good. I, you follow the evolution of pumping technology here at Armstrong. Tony, you did a really good job of, of highlighting it. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> He's the man. And there's a lot less of Tony. If you watch our old videos, uh, yes. Tony plus 100 pounds. So Tony lost some weight. He looks great. He's doing great. I'm and trying to get down to your side, you know? Uh, you're getting here pretty I'm close. close. I'm pretty close. I'm going the other way with all the pizza I've been eating here in Chicago, but it's been a great. Well, as always, thank you so much. Thanks to the Armstrong folks. If you're watching this video and need to get in touch with us or Armstrong, check the show notes. It'll be in there. It'll be on our podcast, the Engineers HVC podcast, and our YouTube channel, HVC TV. And thank you to Heather and Courtney for running the camera behind the scenes. And we'll catch, stay tuned. We're going to catch you on the next one. we got like four more booths interviews today. So thank you for watching. Thank, thank you, Tony. You. Brother, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Great, thank you so it was great seeing right. you, brother. Thank you. I got to come on the podcast at some point. I'll walk you through some of the higher ends. Yeah, there's, I mean.